The DS was a magical system when it came out in 2004. It had a lot of buttons, a dual screen setup, stylus drawing capabilities, and even a mic. But perhaps the most special part of the DS was the games that were built for the DS, and games that were built to take full advantage of its capabilities. While you can find games that use all the standard buttons across systems and consoles, it's rare that you see a game that uses literally everything the system has to offer. Just think about it. What kind of game required you to simultaneously look at both screens, use all buttons, draw different shapes, and even blow into the mic? That's right, it's none other than Cooking Ma- oh, wait, wait, what? We're not reviewing Cooking Mama? <coughs> That's right, it's none other than The World Ends With You, a cult hit released by Square Enix in 2007. I didn't play The World Ends With You when it first came out, because I never knew about it until later in 2013. But even when I was playing it on my 3DS, I knew I was playing a hidden gem. Remember all the things I mentioned earlier? That only counts for half of the mechanics of The World Ends With You. You had crazy stuff like calculating numbers to attack, timing the beat, combos, and dragging environmental objects around to attack. And when you stack all of that with hip-hop, My Chemical Romance, Electronica, a death game plot, an amazing anime art style, an edgy main character, and a weird name, you end up with this miraculous Sunday of a game that had challenging combat, a decent story, and absolute fucking bangers. While it may not rank in my top 5 games ever, it's definitely in the top 10, and probably one of the most memorable games I've ever played. Imagine my surprise when Square Enix announced a remake for the Switch in 2018. I was excited! I was ready to relive my memories back when I first played it on the 3DS. But after playing for a few hours on the Switch, something just felt... missing. What happened to all the drawing I had to do? The dual screen setup? The blowing into the mic? Everything just felt... boring. Nothing was clicking. And after a few hours, I just knew I couldn't continue. And I thought that I would have to take that amazing first experience of all those crazy mechanics in one amazing game and lock it into my heart forever. Come 2022, I go on a random nostalgia trip and I find out that a sequel was released last year by Dying Hope was reignited. And I knew then and there that I had to try it just for a glimpse to relive that same experience in 2013 all over again. And so today, I bring you the experience and review that I had for Neo The World Ends With You. Music has always been important in games, but to someone who's kinda tone deaf like me, I can barely understand the beeps and the boobs. Nonetheless, there are some OSTs that stick with you for the rest of your life. It could be music that goes so well with the game that you might not ever be able to forget that epic, emotionally charged moment. Just like in Near Replica or Near Automata. How could I ever forget the moments of sadness during Kaina's salvation in Near Replica? <laughs> Or the catharsis and goosebumps that you get from the weight of the world in Near Automata. Or maybe it could just be an absolute banger, like the main battle themes from Persona 5. If you pulled me up on the street and mentioned the song name, I'd probably get instant LSS against my will. Wait, what is that? Oh no, please no. You never sing it come back. <clears throat> The music in the world ends with you is probably more on the banger side. While I can't say it's on the same level as the most famous songs from Persona 4 and 5, there are a lot of bangers and way more variety in terms of music, ranging from trance, rap, J-rock, J-pop, and metal. Even if you don't play the game itself, I highly recommend just listening to the OST on Spotify. 
it's hella sick. The ridiculous number of bangers means that you get to listen to different kinds of music in almost every fight. So even grinding out mobs feels pretty cool. Just for mobs alone, I think you get to cycle through around 6 songs, which is absolutely amazing. Boss fights and epic moments have their own amazing soundtracks and really hype up the epic moments in the game. Everything just fits so well with the hip-hop style of the game. So in my opinion, The World Ends With You is well above most other games in terms of music arrangement. Stories are getting harder and harder to define as good or bad nowadays. There are so many different kinds of stories, so I thought it would be easier for me to approach it from an emotional perspective rather than a fully objective or rational perspective. So let's talk about The World Ends With You and its sequel Neo. The premise for both games is pretty straightforward. The main character gets sucked into a mysterious death game, and if he loses, he gets erased. There's a lot of mystery, drama, and other death gamey themes. But to me, those aren't as important. The way I see it, the most important thing was the main theme in both games. The process of growing up. Maybe it's because I played the first game in college, which was when I experienced the most growth. But the main theme really spoke to me after I finished playing the first game. Objectively, I don't think I can remember most of the details of the plot. But just the feeling it left me with, it just never went away after all these years. That feeling of seeing and experiencing growth felt like a journey not just for the main character, but for myself as well. And with this sequel, although the main theme is similar, the nuance is slightly different. What I got from the first game was something more of a breaking out from your shell kind of feeling. But the second game gave me more of a maturing into adulthood sort of feeling. If I had to use an example, I think the first game would be something like growing from an angsty teen to an almost adult. And the second game was like growing from an almost adult to an actual adult with more responsibilities to manage. While Neo's main character, Rindo, seems normal at first, it's obvious that there is a growth process as problems pop up and the story goes on. He's pretty relatable for the most part. And I think it's a big part of his role as a character, because he's actually pretty reasonable. I won't say that the story is perfect and that it has no holes, but the important moments are epic and it was really satisfying to see the story progress and how Rindo grew as a character. Now that I'm playing this game at a different phase in my life, I have a different perspective on the growth process. And there's something unique about seeing how far the main characters from both games have come and it made me reflect on myself and my own personal journey through life. At some point, I had also gone through these growth phases in my life, once in college and again now that I'm working as an adult. The themes that I saw in this the themes I saw in these games just struck a chord with me and probably will continue to stick with me for a long time. Minus the death game and if you die in the game you die in real life part of course. The voice acting was great too. Personally, I'm in the Japanese voices only camp, and I enjoyed it enough for this game. There is a diverse cast of characters, and the voice acting really adds on to it. I only have one complaint, and it's that there's not enough of the voice acting. They only have fully voiced lines at the start and at the end of every chapter, with only one-liners for everything else in between. While the start and end chapters do capture most of the important moments, I feel like there was a lot of character growth during the chapters that should have been voiced. Sometimes, a lot of the emotional moments, you know, especially moments of realization, tend to happen during the chapters. So it's unfortunate that those moments got devalued a bit because of the lack of voice acting. Maybe Square Enix didn't give that much budget for this game, and it's just sad since this game didn't receive much love on release either. But hey, that's the reason I'm digging it up and hopefully sharing this awesome game with the rest of you watching. I mentioned earlier that I couldn't stand the original remake of the game on the Switch. But when I played Neo, I realized that this is what happens 
when Square Enix decides to actually make a full-on New World Ends With You experience for the Switch. Maybe we lost all the fun on the DS that made it fun, like with the blowing, the drawing, but in exchange, we got all of the capabilities of the Switch, aka all 8 buttons. That's right, in this game, you can use almost all 8 buttons at once, and it all depends on which pins you equip. Throughout the entire game, enemies drop pins, and these pins give different powers and abilities, ranging from mashing melee attacks, to shooting, to charging, to timed mines. All these pins have different button assignments, and you can mix and match as you want, though there are certain limitations. Some pins require the button to be held and then released, others require mashing, while others can just be held. Plus, each of the pins have different combo conditions, and it's super cool to mix and match pins to get some combos on enemies. And because each pin has a different button assignment, there's always some variety in terms of what buttons you should be mashing, holding, and releasing, leading to an ever-changing variation of buttons to press. As the game progresses, you get more and more pin combinations, which means you get to do even crazier combos. You can level pins as well, and most pins don't take too long to level. As long as you're not aiming to fully level every single pin in the game, it won't take much grinding to get the stronger pins to max level. Since we've moved out of the DS, we're no longer limited to a 2D plane either, and now we have a full 2.5D plane with an arena, fast movement speed, and a dodge to avoid enemy attacks. You have allies too, but the only thing you control about them is when they attack. The AI is decent, I think. They just auto-dodge most enemy attacks as long as they're not charging any moves, so you don't have to worry about them too much. The only issue is that they might be badly positioned sometimes, but honestly, it's not really that big of a deal. There are a lot of cool enemies with gimmicks, but unfortunately, they end up using recolored versions of enemies later in the game. It's not too bad though, since the powered-up versions of enemies tend to have extra abilities to watch out for, so it's not completely the same. And the sense of difficulty does go up aside from just more enemy HP. In my opinion, the best part about the fights are the bosses. There are a lot of bosses, and each of them have their own gimmicks. The gimmicks themselves are not that hard to dodge. They're pretty intuitive, but they're pretty damn cool because they do crazy stuff like phase changes, perspective changes, and entire arena attacks. The effects are just cool to look at, and figuring out when to dodge and when to burst out attack moves is always a fun part of fighting bosses. The overall progression of the game is pretty nice too. The entire first week of the game feels like a tutorial section, after which you get dumped into a difficulty spike, which really forces you to dodge enemy attacks and practice pin combos. The fights themselves aren't too difficult, but you can chain fights together, which increases rewards like drop rate. The main risk of chaining is that if you lose in any one of the fights, you have to try again from the start. While there's no problem on the easier difficulties, it can present a real challenge on the harder ones, especially because taking a few hits means starting all over again. Even the end game is still a significant challenge when playing on the hardest difficulty, and it's pretty rewarding since some of the strongest pins only drop on the hardest difficulty. I only have one major complaint for the combat in this game. Early in the game, you get an event called Scramble Slam. While this whole event is supposed to be a territory takeover event, you can get points that will give you better rewards at the end if you hit specific milestones. Unfortunately, the first Scramble Slam requires you to hit a ridiculous number of 300,000 points. The only way to get points is to consistently combo enemies. The longer you can combo enemies, the more points you get. Unfortunately, the only way to guarantee 300,000 points with a limited number of encounters available is to deliberately equip weaker pins and slowly combo enemies to death. Basically, the less damage you do, the more points you can get, since you get more of a bonus for comboing. Doing too much damage with stronger pins means the enemies die fast. Doing too much damage with stronger pins means the enemies die too fast before they can give you points for combos. As you can imagine, this is just a slog. Thankfully, there are only two scramble slams in the game, and only the first scramble slam has unreasonable requirements, so it's not too bad. I know it's had a lot. But basically, mashing buttons and figuring out different co button combinations is pretty damn fun. And the different gimmicks of combat really add to the experience. The World Ends With You always held a special place in my heart, and is easily one of my favorite games. Neo came along and did not disappoint. And although it gave a different experience, is now probably also one of my favorites. And is probably one of the best games I've played in 2022. 
Maybe I'm unique in the way I think about this game because I've played it in two different important phases in my life. But honestly, I can't really find someone to compare my experience to. Considering that Neo has only sold 28,000 copies, I've never met anyone in real life who's actually played the game, so I have no one to talk about it with. But I really hope that you guys who are watching this video right now give it a try. Because I really want other people to love this game as much as I do. And if you do play it and finish it, do let me know what you think about it. And if you've already played it, what do you think? Love? Hate it? Lacking? Let me know in the comments below.